Hey, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. This morning, I was going about my business researching. I happened to be in newspapers.com, one of my favorite go-to databases. I've talked about it plenty of times here before on this program and um, doing some research. And as sometimes happens, my eye wanders and I start to hit the peripheral parts of the newspapers.com document. And as I was having the experience this morning, my eyes peered off to the left and I happened to notice this glaring headline, Magnificent Fighting by the Negro Troops. It caught my attention because I wasn't really looking for any big headlines on an inside page of the newspaper, but here it was. So... I oriented myself. My first thought was, oh, I must be looking at some mention of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry and a report that was following the uh, Battle of Fort Wagner in July of 1863. And then I began to focus on the story and I realized, oh, this is something different. We're talking about U.S. colored troops but we're talking about a different time period. In fact, it wasn't July of 1863. It was mid-June of 1864. And it wasn't South Carolina. <clears throat> it was Mississippi. I thought, huh, well, <clears throat> let me give a look here and, and give a read to the story and find out what's going on. It turns out that it was covering an expedition by Brigadier General Samuel D. Sturgis, a West Pointer who with thousands of Union troops had set out on an expedition from Memphis, Tennessee <clears throat> into Mississippi. And there he met up with the forces, or I shouldn't say met up, he clashed with the forces of Major General Nathan Bedford Forrest and his Confederates. The result was a lopsided battle Sturgis and his men were roundly defeated. Uh, hundreds of men, hundreds of Union men were taken prisoner. Uh, the battle goes down in history as a major win in the Confederate column, adding to the military respect that Forrest had had and enjoyed during and after the war. Uh, for Sturgis, didn't go so well. It effectively ended his combat career. So I thought, well, let me check out this story and keep in mind here uh, that um, the story is written two months after the Fort Pillow massacre in which Forrest and his men are accused uh, and following testimony uh, around Fort Pillow and the events there that there were men, there were men of color in the Union Army who were massacred. So two months after the Fort Pillow massacre, we have this event, the defeat of the Sturgis expedition into Tennessee. And um, we also have this news report that mentions the conduct of the African-American troops who were in that battle. Now, I'm not going to go on because it's a rather long story, but I did pick out the three passages that referenced the U.S. colored troops. And apparently, whoever wrote the headline drew inspiration from these three paragraphs. So let me read them to you. The first one is a brief reference, and it says, quote, it is said that the colored troops fought with the most determined desperation and were the last to give away. Here's the second paragraph, slightly longer. It is stated that after the ammunition had become exhausted, many of the Negro troops boarded the ammunition train as it was being destroyed and filled their bosoms and pockets with cartridges and that others of the Negro troops gathered ammunition from the castaway accoutrements of the white troops and thus were enabled to keep up the fight until they reached Memphis. The suggestion here is that the bravery of the black troops 
out of ammunition after the fight and now retreating were able to load their pockets and their cartridge boxes to basically replenish their ammunition with whatever they had on hand. Also suggested but not mentioned here was the fact that these men played a role as the expedition was retreating towards Memphis, that these men with their pockets full of cartridges were able to use those cartridges to keep Forrest's men at bay as they moved back to the confines of Union-occupied Memphis. The last, again, another brief mention of the troops uh, occurs towards the end of the story. Uh, here's that quote. Another body of 300 Negro troops came in this morning, having escaped by various roads. All brought their arms and accoutrements with them. The suggestion here, of course, is that uh, the men did not run. Uh, they did not throw down their arms and skedaddle back to Memphis. On the other hand, they apparently held on to their weapons, and that suggests something of an orderly retreat after the initial uh, moments where Forrest and Forrest's commands uh, had their um, moment of victory and caused the entire Union command under Sturgis to flee the scene. So the two regiments, by the way, that are mentioned here are the 55th and the 59th U.S. Colored Infantries. And this is coming over a year after the 54th Massachusetts brings to light the fighting abilities of black troops in South Carolina. So this report uh, of Sturgis's men from the 55th and the 59th USCT follows. It's one of many stories where you see the African-American troops who are getting mentioned time and again in the northern newspapers for their carriage. So it's reinforcing that narrative that began with the 54th Massachusetts, but continues on through the Union Army as these black men in blue are getting their baptism under fire at various engagements, battles, skirmishes, what have you, across the Southern Territory during the war period. And so an interesting little detail out of the war and, uh, and one that I wanted to share with you today, which I just happened to pick up as I was going through newspapers.com. I'll add one more footnote about uh, Sturgis. If that name isn't familiar to you, uh, it might be when you think about what happened to Sturgis after the war, he went on to remain in the regular army. As I mentioned, he's a West Pointer. He remains in the army and he goes on to join the cavalry, a particular U.S. cavalry regiment, the 7th Cavalry. And his, he's the colonel of the 7th Cavalry. His subordinate officer, his lieutenant colonel, is a man named George Armstrong Custer. So I'll leave it there for today. Until the next time, we'll see you on the trail.